thanks everybody for coming along, giving up your lunch time to listen to, m to me. Um, apologies if isn't here. We're doing an awful lot of workshops with um, different groups around the country. So she's actually in NACE at the moment in a workshop, but hopefully she'll be back um, very, very shortly. Um, I suppose the purpose of this presentation is to sort of just explain to people what Aoife and myself have been up to with Space Engagers for the last 18 months or so. Um, so I, I am going to, I'm going to press the wrong button all the time. I'm going to basically start by just giving some background as to where this has all come from. So looking at Patrick Geddes and his ideas of interactive mapping, um, talking a bit about our journey. So we've had quite an unusual, perhaps slightly unexpected journey from within a PhD process to being uh, running a social enterprise now. Um, and then I'll look at some case studies. Now, th this doesn't really matter if the screen is too blurred. We're not entirely reliant on them. The, 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 the slides are really just to keep me right more than anything else. So, Aoife and myself were funded uh, through our PhDs in the Taurus project, which was led by UCD. Um, and Karen here was one of the PIs in the, in the work package that I was involved in. Um, and Taurus was based, well, it was an acronym for transitioning towards urban resilience and sustainability. Um, and basically, urban resilience being how do cities adapt to disturbance in the, in the present and in the future. Um, and the, the project was basically trying to figure out what does urban resilience mean in practice. A key element of what it means in practice relates to another discourse within urban resilience, which is community resilience. And community resilience has all sorts of familiar things to planners and architects and landscape architects, such as social memory, social networks, participatory processes, utilization of imagination, um, understanding local systems, and also attachment to place. So my way of trying to figure out what urban resilience was in practice, which is what I had to look at as, as, part, as my PhD, as part of this larger project, was to look back, because an awful lot of the things that I was reading about in the discourse were very familiar. Um, so I looked back to the work of Patrick Geddes. Um, now his dates were 1854 to 1932, and he's, he's generally regarded as one of the founders of the time planning movement. I'd suggest he's an awful lot more interesting than that. He talked about a movement called civics, which he described as the science of cities. And he did an awful lot of work in Dublin between 1911 and 1914. He was a Scotsman. Uh, he was a, a polymath. And he lived in a period of very rapid technological, social, and environmental change, very similar to our, ourselves today. And he recognized that there was a transition that was needed between the city as he found it, which if you imagine the late 1800s, early 1900s, was the industrial city, which was an incredibly unhealthy environment. It was very polluted, it was very inefficient, and he called it, I don't know if you can read that, the paleotechnic city. Um, and he said it should be faced and shown at its very worst as dissipating resources and energies as depressing life. So there was a social impact to this physical reality. And he imagined a neotechnic order which would be this energy efficient, low impact, working within the renewable and assimilative capacities of the planet city in the future. And that sort of transition is very familiar. I would suggest that it's, it's, more, it's not so much history repeating itself as, as in that we, it is actually that we haven't finished that transition. We haven't got to that, to that future place yet. So he was very interested in this idea of transition. And one of the key things he recognized for the transition was that everybody needed to be involved. There was no point to trying to impose it from the top down. You had to get as many people aware of what, why there needed to be a transition and to get them involved in actually making the ch change and being part of this process of change. But there was a problem. Sorry, I've moved on too fast. Um, the problem basically was that not everybody was Patrick Geddes. So that, that infuriated him throughout his entire life that people weren't in the same space as him. But the problem that he saw was that people weren't actually aware of what the problems were or aware of their environment. He described them as being half blind. Um, and in this second quote here I, is a, a quote about Galway, about the slums of Galway, where, it, and this isn't actually directly from him, it's from the Irish architect and craftsman, but it says that the evil is notorious, although there are hundreds of citizens who scarcely realize it. And that's from 19, I can't actually read that, it's from 1911, is it? Or 1912? 
1912. So it's this idea that there are all these problems and difficulties around us, but very few people actually see it. We're quite capable of putting out blinkers and not seeing what the problem is. So he was very interested in this idea of civic engagement. And he had two principal mechanisms for civic engagement. The first one was the Civic Museum. And if anybody is familiar with Edinburgh, this building is at the top of the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. Edinburgh was kind of his adopted home. And he turned that into what he called the Outlook Tower, which is an observatory, which basically explained the evolution of the city. But it was quite ambitious because it started by trying to explain the world, then Europe, then language, then Scotland, and then Edinburgh. And when you got to the top up here, you were able to see the mountains sweeping down to the city, sweeping down to the sea. And that was his um, most famous uh, thinking machine, which was this idea of the valley section, that all civilization was contained within this valley section. But he, d he developed this museum, which was to explain to people how their city had become the way it, how it evolved to the present day. And this museum, he, w he wanted an outlook tower in every city, but he only ever developed two, one in Edinburgh and one in Montpellier in the south of France. Um, but he did develop a roadshow version of it called the Cities and Town Planning Exhibition. And it came to Dublin twice in 1911 and 1914. And it went to Belfast, my home city, in 1911 as well. And it was not a success in Belfast. It was a success in Dublin. Literally hundreds of thousands of people went to it, which is quite extraordinary if you imagine a, an exhibition that was essentially about planning. The f in the first instance, got, I think, 160,000 people in 1911 to come to it. And in, this, in 1914, about a quarter of a million people attended it. And that's quite, quite extraordinary when you think of the population of the country at that time. Um, in Belfast, it was not a success. And he, he is quoted as saying it, that they were too obsessed by politics to be interested in, in Belfast. So certain things never really change. So the second civic me or engagement, citizen engagement, civic engagement mechanism was the civic survey. Um, and this seems like a very sort of prosaic idea, but he was basically saying you need to understand the city, you need to diagnose the city before you make any plans for it, which sounds incredibly obvious, but at that time was really quite radical. Surveying was a relatively new idea in terms of surveying the city. There was a lot of surveying of poverty from Roundtree and from Booth, etc., but not actually the city. Um, and so he believed in this idea of diagnosis before treatment. And he saw the survey as a, here's Aoife, <laughs> and he saw the survey as a way to engage people with their place and with local issues. So it was a very engaging process. The survey wasn't to be carried out solely by the planners in the local authority. It was to be carried out in inter with interacting with the citizens. And he set out very detailed instructions for that. So what, one example of a survey drawing that he created with a community group is in Edinburgh from 1908, I think. And this was with, was with a group called the Outlook Tower Open Spaces Committee or something snappy like that. And it was basically a group of Edwardian middle class ladies who saw that there was this incredible amount of poverty and a very unhealthy situation in the old town of Edinburgh and they wanted to do something and here was this slightly eccentric gentleman with a, uh, an incredible beard telling them how, how they could help to make things better in the, in the old town. So they all got together and drew this rather beautiful plan of open spaces and open spaces sounds like well is it parks or is it vacant sites it's actually any space that they felt could do more in the city so it wasn't just vacant sites, it was also spaces that, actually, that were public spaces. So the, the grass market is in there, which is a, an open space in the city. It's a public space. Um, at that time, it was probably a bit run down. It was where you used to be hanged um, in Edinburgh. And they were suggesting, you know, you could do more with this space. And Geddes saw these um, spaces as opportunities for engaging with citizens and reinventing the city. And in the old town of Edinburgh, he used the engagement of these people these ladies um, and the data that they'd come up with to co-create new uses on these spaces. So he developed um, gardens. Um, on, the, on the left here is a garden that was managed and in terms of governance by children. Um, and it was basically a community garden for urban agriculture. And he did some very similar work in Dublin then. And th this is in Dublin. He worked with the Women's National Health Association of Ireland in Dublin, and this is a, a playground that they developed for um, 
children just in behind uh, Christ Church. So there's, there's no example that I've come up with of this type of engagement to, to come up with maps in Dublin, but there is a map from 1913, 1914 um, of spaces that could do more that was developed as part of the inquiry into the housing conditions of the working class in 1913-1914. And this map is essentially, it's interesting because it's basically a strategic management tool for addressing a really severe housing crisis at that time, a sort of unimaginably bad housing crisis at that time. So if we move forward then, so we, we were looking at Geddes and we had this opportunity as part of the tourist project to do an experiment. Um, so we have basically brought some of these ideas of Geddes's in his version of urban resilience, what does it mean in practice, into the 21st century. And we developed this very basic platform called Reusing Dublin, which um, Beth mentioned, which is basically about crowdsourcing information on vacant and underused spaces in the city. And we launched that about April 2015. And it was pretty successful considering the resources that we had, um, but also it was particularly successful in terms of community engagement. We got literally thousands of people getting involved in it um, using social media and using the, the web platform. And the tourist project was kind of delighted with it um, because it was a sort of tangible outcome. And we were put on a sort of uh, what it was called an EU Common Exploitation Booster in Brussels. We had to go over to the, these workshops, which basically, like most workshops, ended up just being endless post-its that you were sticking up around the place to try and understand how this idea could be developed for other places, but also to develop in terms of technology. But perhaps the most successful thing about it, or the thing that Aoife and I found most rewarding, was that the project was spotted by a homelessness charity in the city and to our surprise, they came, approached us and we met them over in a hotel beside Croke Park and they said, look, what you're doing is quite interesting for us because we need to find these spaces and we need to raise awareness. So uh, they took it over then about this time last year um, and it's been reusing Dublin as a sort of awareness raising wing of the Peter McVeary Trust. And they report that it has been very useful for raising awareness They've uh, had a petition on the site that's, that's um, had thousands of signatures on it um, advocating for a new vacant house or vacant homes tax um, to deal with the fact that there's between 35 and 40,000 vacant houses in Dublin, in the Dublin region. Um, so it's raised awareness. It's also provided them with a lot of information on spaces. So they say that that's actually been really useful because they can keep on top of what is a very difficult issue to keep on top of. It's constantly changing. It's very fluid. Um, and they have very limited resources. They've, got, they've had two vacant homes officers in the past six months, and that's the first time they any, ever had any resource to deal with this. And they've also used it to identify projects that they have um, pushed forward. They've researched behind the very sort of elementary information that gets onto the platform, and they've penetrated in behind that um, and have put lists forward to Dublin City Council to bring properties back into use. Um, and that has been successful for them on, on, on certain, in certain instances, but it's actually proven that the, the new legislation for bringing homes back into use is not that attractive to, to property owners, and it hasn't been that successful. So building on that experience of developing a piece of technology that was pretty straightforward um, to gather information, crowdsource information, bring the information into a shared space so that it was useful, we, we won ourselves a place with Karen and Louise, who are both here, um, on a H2020 called Organicity, um, that's between Santander, London, and Aarhus in Denmark. And for some reason, we chose Aarhus, but actually we think Aarhus was a fantastic choice. It wasn't quite as sunny, perhaps. Um, and what happened there was that you had to apply to be an experimenter, and they put up uh, on this platform all these different elements of smart city technologies and you had to take various different pieces and put them into a system that you were going to create and they gave you challenges so the challenge that we responded to to get to get onto it was from Aarhus the city of Aarhus which is kind of the second city of Denmark and they were saying they had some very first world problems they don't really have vacant 
buildings in Denmark because they have a much more sophisticated tax system than us. Um, but they do have underused external spaces. And right enough, when you go around the city, there are these incredibly underused external spaces, and yet everybody's living in apartments, and they want to have more space out in the city. And there's also quite a lack of nature, they were saying, in the city. So they have these, this, uh, these two challenges. So we use their fragments of smart city technologies. Um, we kind of thought it would be dead simple. <laughs> it turned out to be ex extremely complicated. So we, we brought in a software engineer to, to help us with it. Um, but basically, what the app that we developed did was it allowed people to take a picture of a space, to add information about that space that they might know. It went onto a map automatically, and they could put forward ideas for that space. So these are some of the ideas that came up for people take the photograph, it was all, we did a, had a very constrained period of time, it was January, February last year, or no, start of this year, so they would take the picture generally with snow in it um, and say, say something about the space and then put forward their idea and their idea went up onto a, what we called a scenarios notice board. Um, we had a limited period of time to do it, so we cheated slightly in that we worked with a group of master's students in, University of Ar in Aarhus University and there were master's students in experience economy, and it went extremely well. Um, we ran a, a workshop with Karen, um, which was a co-creation workshop, so we took certain ideas that had come out of this process and co-created co them, so that was sort of a mix of co-design, role-playing, etc. Um, and the students responded very positively to that. The whole idea was very attractive as well to the Aarhus Commune, and we, we need to follow up on that, actually. Um, because they have a, an unusual arrangement there where they have a thing called a citizenship department which is specifically set up for citizens to approach and it comes from the commune, it's, it's a, a department from the commune but it's set up specifically for, for citizens to come and say look I've got an idea, I think this would be a really useful thing to do in my neighbourhood. The reason they were interested in what we were doing is that they have this problem where the individuals come to them and they can't give money, they have a fund as well which obviously helps they can't give money to individuals, they'd have to have a community of people that wanted to do something because they'd have to see that it was supporting a greater number. So what they liked about this is that you could build up a momentum about an idea on the technology and they could then spot which ones had, had some potential that met their criteria, etc. So this is just some feedback from the students and um, they're saying yes, before I did not know there were, there were many vacant spaces in Aarhus, etc. And it's really been testing this idea of Geddes is that you can engage people with their place through this process of mapping. So we were interested to see was there something in this, um, but nevertheless we actually managed to get some funding from them and they're funded by the Department of Housing, Planning, Communities, Local Government, whatever it is now, and Google.org. We also got funding then from Climate Kick, which is an EU um, fund fund basically, they were interested in what we were doing firstly because they could make the connection between efficient use of buildings in, in towns and cities and climate change and resource depletion, but also they could see that the mechanism could be applied to all sorts of different things and that civic engagement with issues such as um, climate mitigation or climate adaptation issues was extremely important. So, so we got some money from them and that allowed us to basically set up a social enterprise which is a company limited without a company limited by guarantee and it's the only model in Ireland that exists for social enterprises and we've been able to employ two staff we have a, a full stack software developer and we have a user interface designer and we've been able to develop up a, a system basically um, which is basically ex exploring Gadesian ideas so ideas of Patrick Geddes and those ideas being that citizens know their area better than anywhere else, anyone else. They know their locality. They want to contribute to address to these problems, but often they seem intractable and very difficult to get involved with. And that mapping is actually a really good way of engaging people because it can actually be enjoyable. And so what we're doing is basically developing what we call interactive mapping technologies. It could also be called participatory mapping. There's a, a unit in UCL in London that calls it participatory mapping. And we're basically saying interactive mapping is when you, a lot, you enable individuals to make observations, their own observations, and add their own knowledge, and to post that onto a communal shared space, which is a map. 
so that everybody can see that. And when you have the, all of that in the one place, then you can start to make sense of whatever issue it is. You can see the bigger picture. And you can also then interact with other people's posts, the other things that people have put up. You can start these conversations. So we're exploring the ability of interactive mapping to do three main things. Um, to gather inf useful information that's at a hyper-local level that is often missing. Um, we have a lot of macro-level data, but we're making presumptions on that. Um, and this, this is maybe an opportunity to get this local grain to engage people with issues through the process of mapping, so to raise awareness and, and engage them with it. And then with the engagement and with the information to try and find new ways of doing things. And then Danielle, our UI designer, added in another one that it can make you, it can get you fit at the same time. So we added that one in. The system that we've set up has three, three major parts to it. Um, there's a mobile app, which I'm going to ask you all to download in a minute. Um, we then have a web map, which is, the same, which is essentially the same thing, but on your computer. Um, but you can also use it on your phone if you don't want to actually use an app. There's a, a deeper, there's a, another layer to this one for customers or moderators of whatever project we're working on, that they can log in and they can, they can sort of check that there aren't any dodgy um, entries or um, they can edit and they can add their own comments. And then back of house, there's this thing called GeoKey, which was developed by some people in UCL, which is basically the... Um, infrastructure that you use to set up different projects. Um, you can manage um, the access to the data and you can store the data through that. So it's, it's actually basically a system which, which has sort of evolved over the last six or seven months. Um, we're still obviously at a, at a very early stage, so we're still at a prototype stage uh, or a minimal viable product. I don't know how many minimal viable products we, we're going to have. We seem to have endless number of them. Um, what we have is one core app essentially. So it's the Space Engagers app, and it hosts a number of different projects. And we're hoping that it'll start to host a very large number of projects when we really get ourselves off the ground. And basically, what it does is it, you open up the app. This is obviously a slightly stretched version. You have to scroll down this, and you choose which project you want to get involved with. And then when you get into the project, you simply post a photograph. You take a photograph, or you get one from your gallery, post it onto the map. It's automatically geolocated. Geo you confirm it's in the right spot. You're asked then, do you have any information on that? Um, you're, you're given criteria within which to, to put these posts up. Ask if there any information you want to add, any hashtags you want to add, and then it's loaded up onto the map. When, it's, when a post is up on the map, you can click on it. There's also a feed from this button. You can, you can go into the individual entries, and you can then, I don't know if do I have that in the next slide, you can then share that. No, I don't. You can share that entry um, on social media, or you can comment on it, or you can like it. Um, very similar to how, how it works on different platforms. So our aim is to build up a large number of users of this app throughout the country. So the app will tell you if you're in Longford today, there's actually a project in Longford you might want to contribute to that. Or you're in Dublin, there's a project in Dublin on vacancy. Would you like to contribute to that? So we're avoiding this, what we initially would have started out doing, which would be having lots and lots of little different projects all around the country, each with their own app that you have to download, and it's a complete nuisance. So the idea is to collect it all into one space. That is a slight communications challenge, so we have to figure that one out. Um, but the idea is to build up this sort of movement of people who are using their observations of their environment. So obviously, people involved in planning and architecture and landscape architecture are absolutely perfect for this. Um, using their observations, their knowledge, and their tech as well for good, so that the tech that you have in your pocket isn't just for socializing, there's actually there's something very useful that could be done with it. So we've been calling ourselves Pokemon Go with a social conscience, although we've, we have a bit of work to do on the tech to get to the Pokemon Go stage. So how am I doing on time? I thought it'd be useful to just talk about two case studies. Um, one of, one of them which we're working on as a, a, a social enterprise, and the other we're working on as a research unit in UCD. Um, so this first one is in Longford. Um, and in Longford, we basically adapted the mechanism that we had for reusing Dublin, which was about mapping vacant and unused spaces. We've adapted that for urban regeneration. 
um, the client that we have, it's the Herb Act Group, so it's an EU pro program um, that gives money for enabling projects, not for capital. And they have a project in, in Longford. Um, and the client said to us they didn't want an app that, m that mapped a vacancy because Longford is, is one of the towns in Ireland that's had a, a very tough time over the last 20, well, 10, 15 years. Um, it's probably had a tough time for a bit longer than that, actually. Um, and there's only bad news stories come out of Longford. And it, it's, it's really tangible when you go there. It's quite, quite powerful. And so they don't want any more negativity. They want, actually, what they want is for people to start seeing the potential in the town, to can see the potential in it. And they also wanted to get as many people involved as possible because they're tasked with coming up with an, I think they're calling it an integrated area plan for the town or an integrated area regeneration plan. And they have to submit that to the EU to get their funding. So we, we looked at um, Geddes' ideas about urban regeneration. He would be one of the first people to talk about urban regeneration and ur urban conservation. And he would have said, you need to understand the place fully before you can make any plans for the future. And that's not just understanding it in terms of bricks and mortar, it's in terms of understanding it socially and culturally so that you don't destroy something that's incredibly valuable to the community. It's also about understanding the place in the past so that you can interpret it in the present. And it's only then that you can actually start coming up with ideas for the future. And then his major thing was that you need to involve as many people as possible. So we're exploring can this um, technology engage as many people as possible with this idea of regenerating their time. So we, we had a launch event um, in the summer, doesn't look like the summer there, which was kind of extraordinary. We didn't plan it, the, the client planned it. It was an incred incredibly layered event. It was in a, an under, well, a completely vacant barracks in the town, so that was the last. The final straw for Longford was that they built a huge shopping centre destroyed all sorts of historic buildings to build this monstrous shopping centre that never opened and is sitting there like a rotting hulk in the middle of the town. And right next to it is a huge and very historic barracks complex that was closed down in, I think, 2009. And that's had a massive effect on the town. The town is, really has a huge hole in it. Um, so we had the launch in that location. All these people from the army, uh, retired people from the army, came and set up in, in set up an exhibition of militaria in, and flags and medals and all that sort of thing in the building. Um, we had a pipe band. I can't remember what else we had. It was just extraordinary. And ev everybody with a medal or a chain in the local area came, came to it. So it, the idea of having something positive, having this project, really got people out. And it, it was quite an extraordinary event. I mean, Aoife and I were kind of speechless <laughs> for most of it. So. Um, what we've developed there is an app. It is working. So basically, it figures out that you're in Longford. It shows you what other people have put up. But you can then post yourself, and you choose whether you're going to post something about the past, the present, or the possible. So you've been asked, it, take pictures of somewhere in the past that you associate with the past and the time. So there's all sorts of weird things come up there, such as um, the man that Jane Austen based Mr. Darcy on is buried in the local church. Church of Ireland churchyard, um, a guy called uh, Thomas Lefroy, who is the Attorney General, I think, of Ireland. Um, Alan Turing's mother is buried in the town. So there's all these connections to interesting people, and that might sound like tiny pieces of information, but if you're trying to put up a tourist strategy for Longford, maybe there's something in those. Maybe that, that is a, a, a starting point. You might also just be, a, there might be a story that my grandmother grew up above the local butcher shop on the main street. Sounds innocent enough. Nobody lives on the main street anymore. So it, young people looking at it go, well, that's weird. Somebody actually lived on the main street. Oh, yeah, maybe I'd like to live on the main street. So it's just making sure that that human capital isn't lost and maybe there's something valuable in it. The idea of taking pictures in the present is, well, what, what's your experience of the time? What do you value in the present? That's actually morphed in the reality of it into how people find the town, and so it's not just positive things, a lot of very negative things come into the, the present one. And then possible is about asking people, what are your ideas for the town? Do you, what's your idea for a particular space? What would you like to see happen in your town? So again, the individual's observation or knowledge or thoughts are brought into a shared space that everybody can see. You can see the bigger picture um, and hopefully see patterns, but also interact. And really what we're trying to do is to create 
a fun and engaging way for people to get involved and play an active and useful role in regenerating their time and inform and inspire the community but also the decision makers because all of this will be observed by people that are tasked with a very difficult task with no resources. I mean, there's one person having to do this plan, basically, for the EU. That They have almost no resources in the planning department in, in Longford, and they have no architect, although I think they employed somebody a few months ago. They have, they have had no architect. So even shortly after the, uh, the launch, uh, we could see little conversations turning up. Um, this one we rather liked. It's about a, an amazing building in the centre of the town called the Providers Building, which is a sort of modernist building that has been preserved in, completely intact um, and is reused by every so often for art exhibitions and things. And people were talking about, well, how could it be used in the future? And somebody came up with, what about a shared kitchen so that, that met all the regulations that people could book for different periods um, during the week and they could maybe start, start micro-businesses, etc. But nobody in the council had thought of that idea hasn't been discussed out in the open, so it, it starts getting discussed here. So it's kind of interesting to see that. But there hasn't been an awful lot of activity compared to what we would have hoped um, until we, we actually got down to the town a few weeks ago and started meeting people and doing workshops with them. And it's really only when you do, we were finding that it's only when you do that that you start to get a lot of, a lot of information. So we went down a few weeks ago, well, a month ago, um, and we took over the provider's building. Uh, we were allowed to go into the, the ground floor of it. Um, we didn't get an awful lot of people passing by, and we find generally that the, the whole sort of interaction one-to-one -one thing of harassing people on the street or the shopping centre was kind of disheartening and <laughs> very resource inefficient. But what was quite efficient was the workshops, and people really responded. So these are workshops where you basically have a map and you ask people to map things on the map, physical map. Um, and the one on the left there is in the local authority, so it's planners and um, different, different um, people in the local authority coming together, working on different maps. This was one for older people in the library. They have an inc incredible library, which is basically the centre of the community in Longford. And they're basically simple mental maps where people tell us things about the past, about how they find the town in the present, places they like, places that they avoid, etc. We did several workshops with youth groups and schools that I obviously can't show photographs of, but they were extremely successful in terms of getting engagement um, and picking up a lot of information. Yeah, I heard you, Louise. <laughs> um, so this just, these are just some examples of the, of, the, of the maps, and that information is now being uploaded by IFA in the last few days up onto the, to the platform. So it isn't the, what we're finding is that it is, the app isn't necessarily being used to the same level, but actually there is still huge value in having the information from the workshops being up and in an accessible place that people can then respond to. So we have, um, this is one that we actually started off ourselves, and if you find that on the app, a, it literally goes down to, for miles, this conversation. This is one from a multicultural women's group that IFA did a workshop with, and they're pointing out this extraordinarily awful estate um, called Ardna Casa, which has really significant social problems in it and they, they are, I think that says something like people are afraid on it. So that, you know, there's really quite powerful information coming out of these exercises. So just moving quickly on, we are, we have managed to get ourselves employed onto a research project um, run by the Earth Institute and the School of Biology and Environmental Science. It's called Ecostructure. So we now not based in Richview, we're, we're based over in the O'Brien Center for Science. And basically, Ecostructure is about raising awareness of eco-engineering solutions for coastal structures. So basically saying we can design these structures so that they're not quite as damaging to local ecosystem services and to the marine ecosystems, and also not as damaging to coastal communities. We're running the work, civic engagement work package um, because that's, what we, that's the sort of area that we fit into. So we will be basically asking people to tell us about different coastal structures that might be in their area, different coastal communities. And that information could be extremely useful to understand these structures. What were they used for in the past? They might have been used for something that 
involved diesel or involved pollution, and that may be why a certain organism hasn't settled there, or maybe why a certain org organism has settled there. Um, but it's also, we're developing a platform so that people will give information, but they'll also receive information because the, a lot of the engaging aspects of the research, the exciting aspects, will be communicated through the platform. So, looking forward, this is us, Aoife on the left, me on the right, and we Ed and Danielle in the middle. Um, we're trying to develop this up as two things, a research unit and as a social enterprise. So in terms of the research unit, um, we're looking at research projects, EU-funded research projects as an opportunity to develop different functions and adapt, adapt this simple mechanism of interactive mapping to different situations so that in a funded and secure manner we can actually move this forward. Um, because at the moment we don't necessarily have a particularly commercial product and um, all the customers that we would want to be using this are not necessarily going to be paying us enough to keep the thing running. Um, it all fits with a lot of established and emerging literature on participatory planning or on civic tech. And we also what then want to remain as a social enterprise. That gives us a certain amount of agility. We can, it opens different doors, it opens different funding opportunities, and again, merges with different products and services that are emerging in the civic tech and citizen inquiry space. But in the immediate future, and this is why I want everybody to get out their mobile phones, if, please download the app, because we have a new version of Reusing Dublin, which we're launching on the 11th of December with the Peter McVeary Trust. Um, and it will, it's a very simple tool that will allow you to map vacant and underused spaces throughout Dublin. So your individual observations going onto a shared map that can be seen by everybody, different conversations can start, different bits of information might materialize, people might see your post about a house in your terrace that's been empty and say, well actually I know who owns that, or I've, I used to live in it, or I know that that house has some um, difficulty legally, etc basically giving a, a head start, a first step to the Peter McVeary Trust when they're trying to bring these properties back into use. So you basically all you have to do is to go to the App Store or the Play Store um, or go to our website, which is spaceengagers.org, and download the app and please use it. Okay, thanks very much.